Welcome to Forward Filmmaker, a podcast from Film Hub. I'm Max Sanders. You may know me from my podcast, Buzz in the Tower, where I discuss my favorite 80s films. But this one is different. The film industry is changing, and filmmakers must adapt. On Forward Filmmaker, we'll be talking with directors and producers about the pains and opportunities facing the modern filmmaker. This podcast is brought to you by Film Hub, the number one film distribution platform. Join thousands of filmmakers who are keeping their rights and getting paid on time. Submit your film today at filmhub.com and have it streamed on Amazon Prime Video, IMDb TV, Tubi, the Roku Channel, Plex, and dozens more. Joining us today is actor, writer, producer, and director Michelle Elin. She's held all of those titles on four award-winning features, including the first lesbian comedy trilogy, Butch Jamie, Heterosexual Jill, and s and Sally. She has worked on everything from music videos to documentaries to features. Her work strikes a comedic tone while dealing with issues of gender, sexuality, stereotypes, and identity. Through her LA-based production company, Ballet Diesel Films, she's currently working on a feature and a docuseries. Today, we'll be discussing how she shapes queer and DIY filmmaking movements through comedy. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so excited because you've made some powerful and just really funny films, including the first lesbian comedy trilogy. How would you describe your work to people that don't know it? Uh, I would describe my work as deadpan satire. Um, there are definitely comedies that are meant to be entertaining, but hopefully make you think a little bit as well. And so to, just to give a quick overview, um, the trilogy, the Butch Jamie trilogy, the first one's called Butch Jamie, and I call that mm. a satire on gender and it's kind of like a lesbian twist on tootsie and heterosexual jill is the second one i call that a satire on sexuality and it's uh, a little bit similar to uh but i'm a cheerleader but it's kind of its own thing too it takes the uh, ex-gay movement and makes a comedy around that and then the third one is it's called s&m sally and i call that a satire on sexuality and that movie uh i created because i didn't see any really other movies that portrayed the BDSM community in an accurate, realistic way. So I do that and hopefully in a funny and relatable way for people. I love the titles. I like they're, they're going to stick in my head forever. S&M Sally just kind of rolls off the tongue. <laughs> yeah, cool. Thank you. <laughs> but so in the trilogy, you're really talking about Jill and Jamie's kind of struggle with sexuality and how they feel about each other. And it feels very real to life. Are these characters based on experiences you've had? You know, um, mo the Jamie character that I play, because I'm an actor as well, is based loosely at times on some of my personal experience. The other characters are, are fabricated um, to tell the needs of the story. But um, Butch Jamie, uh, my character gets cast as a man in a film. Now, of course, that never happened to me. But as somebody who is gender nonconforming and 20 years ago, things were a lot different than they are now too. People would see me with a little baseball cap around town and think I was a boy. So that wove its way into the story and also just sort of general angsty career, um, filmmaking, film industry stuff in my 20s kind of wove its way into the story, even though it was a fictional way. And um, Heterosexual Jill is probably the least personal story, but there's aspects in it like Jamie's like having, who's very much attached to her lesbian identity. I kind of poke fun at this idea, in addition to Jill um, going to ex-lesbian meetings, Jamie's starting to dream about you know her her best friend's penis, and she's kind of having this her own little identity crisis, just to kind of poke fun at um, the way, regardless of where you are on the spectrum of sexuality, sometimes people can be sort of overly attached to who they think they are and who they think they should be. And then for S and M Sally, um, I became curious and just going to BDSM clubs around Los Angeles. I thought it was a really interesting world. It's nothing like you see in the movies. It's, mm. uh, I think the movies portray it as either scary, dark, or weird, or on a more serious level, or on the comedies they portray it as just sort of like silly and ridiculous. And so I was like, I think I can do a really good character-driven comedy, like a fish-out-of-water story, exploring this world in a way that hopefully like people who are who have never heard of BDSM or know anything about it can relate to it. And hopefully people who have been in the scene for a number of years can also relate to it. And Jill has ideas of her own, but also Jamie does too. And it takes a while for her to really uh, realize that that's kind of suits her better. Yeah. Jamie uh, yelling as a dom was the hardest I laughed. <laughs> <laughs> I <think it's> not... <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of fun to shoot for sure. So let's back up a bit. What inspired you to get into filmmaking? 
Yeah, well, um, I think I, you know, I got into filmmaking sort of like piece by piece. And so, um, because, you know, I'm I'm an actor, writer, director, editor. And so when I was very young, about eight years old, I got into theater acting and, and I was a shy kid and it was a way for me to express myself. And so I did theater for a number of years. Um, in junior high, I started just shooting and editing videos at home. We had a VHS camcorder and a VCR that I could edit just VCR to VCR. Um, started taking some classes in high school and college. And then um, honestly, when I graduated from college, I really liked writing and directing and Also, um, I, as an actor, uh, you know, especially because this was 20 years ago, I didn't feel like I was commercial enough to really be an actor. So it's kind of, it's kind of funny to me looking back because 20 years ago, I was like, well, I'm not going to act anymore, which, you know, and I've acted in like all my projects since, but writing and directing, you know, is especially when you're young and you don't know a lot about the industry. It's like, well, how do I become a writer director? So at the time I thought it was very sensible to, uh, be an editor. And it was, and it was a really great skill to kind of hone professionally. So I moved out to Los Angeles after college and got an internship, started working with other filmmakers. And it was really in working with other filmmakers that it showed me, that it inspired me more to do my own content. And it showed me how it might be accessible through film festivals and shooting uh, inexpensively on mini DV at the time and stuff. And then I ended up going a couple years later to the LA film school to be formally trained in writing and directing. So what what made you kind of carve out this niche about satirizing gender, sexuality, stereotypes, and identity? Um, when I was uh, in film school, I did this a serious film. It was it had some comedic elements. I think that anything serious I do will have comedic elements in it. But I wanted to uh, do a comedy for my first feature, and I thought I could do a comedy, uh, low budget, fun, entertaining. Um, you know, hopefully find an audience with it, et cetera. So I set out to do a comedy and I was racking my brain for concepts and ideas and characters. And then I ended up creating the Jamie character. Um, And then it just, you know, I, it just sort of evolved from there because the movie at the time, like the whole idea of it is like, well, what's a low budget comedy I can do? I don't have a lot of money and what can I do that I think will be fun for people? But then sort of my own, and I majored in sociology in college. So, you know, I studied a lot about gender and sexuality and queer studies in college, and it kind of wove its way in there, even though that wasn't necessarily my intent. And then, then, then I just, the feedback that I got on the first film, even though it was such a small uh, production was really great and it really resonated with people and it encouraged me to kind of expand upon those ideas in the other two films. Awesome. So writer, director, producer, editor, do you plan on having all these hats on in the future films? I enjoy it for sure. I think uh, I still edit my own work. Maybe in the future I would work with another editor. Um, Of course, the more you do it, it helps your budget. And so there's that too. But I just also really like the process of it, Um, especially, especially if it's a project I act in and I don't anticipate always acting in my work, but, um, but I have. And so, especially when you act in something that you're directing, it's kind of nice for me personally as an editor to sit with the footage later. And so it's kind of a nice sort of workflow for myself. But in terms of acting, I always kind of say like, Oh, just this one film. And then it ends up being another, Oh, this is my last film. And then there's, do you think you'll be able to let someone else edit your projects or you'll just push them out of the way? And just start <laughs> stuff? I think, I will for sure, but I do think it would be really hard finding the right person because, yeah, it can be frustrating, you know, to because even just in general, I when I work with people with things I don't have any, I, I don't know how to compose music, but that process can be challenging sometimes to to be like, oh, I wish I could just dive in there and just create it, you know, because. Um, communicating that sometimes in other ways is difficult when you don't know either the skill or the technology or whatever. But yeah, I think it would definitely take time to find the right person. Yeah. So let's talk comedy now. Your movies have this air of lightness in dealing with sometimes really heavy emotional topics like sexuality and identity. How do you think about incorporating comedy into these kind of really dense roles? Yeah, well, it's interesting because I never really knew how to answer this. And then I finally finally clicked that it's not necessarily that I have an idea and I'm like, could this be a drama or could this be a comedy? And then I go with a comedy. It's more like I wanted to specifically do a comedy. I came up with the idea. And I think that it's more like the dramatic elements found its way into the comedy 
rather than I started from a dramatic premise and I made it funny. And I think like, and I have plenty of other premises that I think would work well as a dramatic movie, but then I think the comedy ends up finding its way into that movie. So I think even if something's like largely comedy or largely drama, I think blending some of the other element in there makes it interesting for me. And the the more dramatic elements in the comedies give it some weight and some meaning that I just think is more interesting than just personally. I think um, when I watch when I watch something, I want something a little more a little more that I can sort of think about too. Yeah, the honey with the medicine. It really feels like learning <laughs> yeah. about the S and M community. I'd never seen a movie where, you know, hey, here's an education in it, but it's also hilarious. <laughs> right, right, yeah. So when it comes to kind of introducing people to new communities, have you seen your work influence the way people understand and connect to the LGBTQ plus community? Well, you know, of all different kinds of people um, find their way to the film. I, I definitely created the movies for LGBTQ audience, but people from all over the spectrum find their way to the film. And I think that um, it all hits them in different ways. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And so definitely people outside of the community, uh, sometimes I think they're surprised how much the movies resonate with them. Because I, I do, I like to think I focus on universal themes of relationships and truth and on t- authenticity and this and that. So even though, for example, Jamie's struggling maybe with uh, her gender presentation and the way people perceive that, it's still done in, it's still like wrapped in the universal theme of being true to yourself, being authentic to yourself, et cetera. So that I think that people kind of connect to and can relate to that part of it. So um, I think that, you know, the 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 movie S and M Sally has been interesting because as I mentioned before I I set out to create it for both people who didn't know anything about BDSM and might even be a little afraid of it or scared of it mm. and people who were well you know well seasoned or well versed in that lifestyle and to kind of bridge that gap through my character Jamie exploring this world for the first time and then of course beyond that level. It's really about insecurity and relationships, pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone, and those kind of universal themes that the S&M and the polyamory and all the other stuff is just kind of like the backdrop of the story to make it fun and interesting, but then there's something kind of underneath it all. So being a filmmaker, what do you hope for the future of the LGBTQ filmmaking community and on-screen representations? Yeah, I mean... uh, it, things are starting to change in terms of on-screen representation, but I love um, seeing gender non-conforming characters on screen. It's taken us a while to get there. I'm seeing it more, honestly, in television right now. Uh, HBO Showtime, they're starting to expand. Um, yeah, Millions is really good with that. Right, yeah. yeah. That's on my list. I got to check that out. So it's starting to change, and that's something that, um, that yeah, personally resonates with me and that I'd love to see more of. And so I think it's, it's exciting. I think with film, it's difficult because film is generally done at a bigger budget than television, just generally speaking in terms of the industry, Mm -hmm. um, the more they're like, well, it has to appeal to quote unquote everybody. And therefore we're going to show these watered down versions of people that everyone quote unquote can relate to. And I, I don't think that those people, those, these sort of generic sort of people or portrayal of queer life is that interesting for me personally. So I love to see the diversity of representation for sure. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad it's going in the right direction. So let's talk about the kind of the back end. You've sold your work to Netflix and Hulu and also mm-hmm. distributed on Film Hub. What's your advice on how to approach distribution? Yeah, well, a couple things. One is that I think um, people need to ask themselves some questions. First is like, you know, what's ultimately more important to you, money or eyeballs? Now, Sometimes money and eyeballs go together, right? But they don't always, right? And so um, Mark Stoloroff that uh, hosts something called No Budget Film Club, he has this interesting breakdown of where he shows somebody distributing hit their movie through IFC, huge distributor, and somebody self-distributing. And basically how even though you might gross a lot more money through IFC, by the time everyone takes their cuts and the expenses and the yada, 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 and your SAG residuals, you're en- you end up with a lot less money than if you would have self-distributed. But you're going to get more eyeballs through IFC. So mm-hmm. the first thing is you have to you have to ask yourself what what really your goals are. And then the second thing is how much time you're willing to put into something. 
So me, I'll tell you what works really well for me, but it wouldn't necessarily work for somebody else if they're not willing to put the time or the effort and energy into something. Because a lot of times filmmakers don't want to. They're like, here, take my movie. I don't want to deal with it, which isn't all that successful now. I think most people will tell you Mm -hmm. for your movie really to get seen or make money, you need to be more hands on even more so now than it was, you know, 10 or so years ago. So I like to do generally, if I'm able to hybrid distribution deals with companies, and that may change if I found a a, a big distributor that wanted exclusivity that made sense financially or whatever, or for exposure or whatever. But so I do hybrid distribution deals, which basically means non-exclusive agreements. I do work with, um, I guess you could say a traditional distributor that specializes in LGBTQ content, but mm-hmm. I was lucky enough to get a non-exclusive arrangement with them. They kind of said, we need these certain platforms um, type thing. And then we kind of, you know, go from there. So non-exclusive with them, non-exclusive with Film Hub. And then I also personally shop the movie to other platforms because there's always new platforms coming up. Um, there's a lot of niche platforms. There's also a platform that Film Hub now works with and my distributor now works with, but I connected with them early on called Canopy that goes to colleges and universities. And I've made more money through Canopy than I made through Netflix. And so sometimes, yeah, sometimes things can be surprising if you get on the right right platform for your audience. And so I was able to do a direct deal with Canopy years ago, and they don't do that anymore now with filmmakers because they've expanded and grown. And And I heard about them through a filmmaker group I'm a part of. If you're willing to put in the time to shop your film around, and I've shopped it to women's platforms, LGBTQ platforms, et cetera, do direct deals. I find it also more satisfying. So I work with platforms that my other companies don't work with. So it gets out there more and hopefully I make more money. And I also find it more satisfying than to kind of sit around and be like, well, nothing's happening. You know, you get to like make it happen yourself, you know? Well, you need to add another title to your list of, you know, writer, director, distribution expert. Definitely. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much for sharing. So let's take... Let's take distribution out of it. What is your dream project? Pretend you have all the time and money in the world. Yeah. Well, (laughs) I did. My first script actually that I wrote is the only script I haven't produced. And it's a lesbian 1920s flapper story in New York City. And um, yeah, and I I wrote it to be done at a a bigger budget. And at the time, this was years ago, so they were younger because they were supposed to be in college. At the time, I wanted Scarlett Johansson and Maggie Gyllenhaal to play play different characters in the movie. But um, yeah, it would be fun to see. I think like the 1920s is a very interesting decade for queer history because there was kind of its own sort of like sexual liberation before things kind of clamped back down in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And so there was uh, a lot of sort of like flappers experimenting with sexuality. I think it's just sort of an interesting underground with prohibition and everything like that. I don't know if it's like my ultimate dream project, but it's definitely something that would be fun to do at some point. No, you need to get that done. Like that sounds, <laughs> that sounds incredible. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so this is more a me question. Uh, mm-hmm. You have some really fun and kind of eclectic soundtracks in your films. Like in mm-hmm. Butch Jamie, there's that kind of ska positive punk soundtrack. How do you use music to set the mood? Yeah, I mean, um, music's music can be challenging for sure. I think music, you know, with these movies, because all of them are supposed to be fun and energy and uplifting and whatever, I, I try to find music that I think complements the tone as well as the story. And also specifically, but Jamie, there's some songs that we specifically wrote to enhance some of the comedy. So for mm-hmm. all the music in Butch Jamie, uh, I worked my composer. Uh, wrote, we kind of collaborated in writing the songs together and his sister did the vocals. So most of those songs, except one, were specifically for that movie. And then for Heterosexual Jill and s and Sally, uh, those songs were licensed from indie bands. But in addition to that, um, you know, the score is really important, especially like in comedies. I think the score can be used as a way to enhance the beats and the moments in the comedies. But it, there's a fine line because... I think sometimes when you see comedies, they're, they kind of overuse the music of like, it's funny, blah, blah, blah. And it's like mm-hmm. this huge sort of hit on the joke. And so it's kind of like this delicate balance of like, I want to find a way to support the humor without broadcasting it, right? So yeah. generally, like in these movies, the style of music we came up with on the score side was this idea that there would be 
music playing and then sometimes not all the time but instead of accentuating the comedy with like a big hit it would the music would kind of stop and you'd find these like pauses and beats and these moments which kind of coincides with a little bit with the deadpan humor because a lot of the jokes are kind of looks and moments anyway so with that music tied to comedy what kind of comedic influences have inspired your films Comedic influences. Well, um, Christopher Guest is definitely a big comedic influence for me. I, when I was an actor, a theater actor, I shied away from doing comedy because I felt like there was a lot of pressure, especially on stage, to be funny. And so I did more dramatic stuff. And then when I watched uh, Best in Show, I thought it was hilarious. Oh my God, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It showed me a way to do comedy that felt more grounded and real and you know he excels at doing deadpan comedy and it and it, and, and it was like it just sort of clicked for me of like oh i think like this is my kind of comedy even though i mean i think the butch jamie trilogy the comedy isn't really christopher guest that was kind of my starting point of getting mm-hmm. into it and that led to my first short film and exploring that through at that at that time a mockumentary style of shooting a bunch of stuff and this is where my editing also really helped because I could shoot a bunch of stuff and have, and I felt like as an editor, I had the confidence that we could edit it together and we can make it funny later, even if we were, we were shooting it, it wasn't quite working. So it took out the pressure for me that I felt like as an improv actor or on stage, that was kind of like, uh, I, I'm not so sure I can do this to like, great, I can just sort of do it. And then if it doesn't work, no one needs to see it. And then through that process of editing it and putting it together and screening it for audiences, um, that's very helpful in terms of showing you like what works, what doesn't, and doing it again and again, and hopefully, you know, getting better each time. Yeah, it's a different kind of comedy than standing on stage and be like, oh, no, that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. And what a role model, too. Christopher Guest might be the coolest guy on the planet Earth. Princess Bride, <laughs> right. married to Jamie Lee Curtis. That's probably the funniest family in America. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. So, fun question. If you had to get a movie-inspired tattoo, what would you get? Well, I think, like, I don't know if this is kind of a lame answer because I don't, there's not, like, a movie that I've seen that I would want to, like, put on my body forever. So I thought it would be cool maybe to have, like, a film strip and then with each movie that I personally do have like a still in the film strip represent like that movie. And then you could kind of add to it as you create more stuff. Eventually your whole body's covered. You know, you're 90 and you have 250 projects all over. <laughs> yeah, it'd be awesome. <laughs> so speaking of projects, what are you working on right now? Yeah. So right now I'm in post-production on a, a dramedy called Maybe Someday. It's... Um, uh, about uh, my characters separating in the process of separating from her wife and she's trying to move forward with her life. And it's very, very different than the other movies. And I was wanted to tackle a new challenge with it. And so we're in the final stages of post-production and we're going to be screening at festivals next year. I think spring or summer, we'll kind of see how that all shakes down. And then I'm also in uh, pre-production work getting close. We're kind of in the research phase, moving into pre-production on a docu-series that my partner and I are doing about non-binary identities and experiences. Awesome. So do you think you're going to take on more genres? No, I think I would be surprised if I do, because I think comedy and drama are really like the two that speak to me the most. Other than documentary, I'm, I'm interested in documentary, but yeah, yeah. the others, I, I'm not so sure I'd, I'd be able to tackle. Yeah, dramedy and comedy both tie together really easily. So, yeah. Yeah, some the, yeah. Some of the funniest movies are also some of the saddest. Right, yeah. So, where can people find your work? Um, so, all of my films are available on both Amazon and Tubi TV in certain countries. And then worldwide, Vimeo is really the best place to watch it. If, uh, if people want to follow me on Twitter, you, they can find me at Ballet Diesel or look me up on Facebook. I'm also on Instagram at Maybe Someday Film. Wonderful. Well, Michelle, thank you so much. And I just hope you have a hundred more projects and I need to see what happens to Jill and Jamie down the road. Thanks for having me. Finding an audience can be the greatest challenge a filmmaker can face. Film Hub is the answer to the distribution problems of the film community. Film Hub has helped countless directors get their projects onto major streaming services. So if you are finding the distribution side of filmmaking a frustrating battle, let the number one film distribution platform do the heavy lifting for you. Thanks for listening. 
please subscribe, rate, and review Ford Filmmaker on whatever podcast platform you're using. The smallest gesture makes a world of difference, and we so appreciate it. On the next episode of Ford Filmmaker, we'll hear from actor-turned-director David Lasher on how he made the leap from being in everything from Sabrina the Teenage Witch and Beverly Hills 90210 to writing and directing his own work.